Nadam se da možemo da počnemo sa ovom našom popodnevnom sesijom. Imam veliku čast i zadovoljstvo da vam predstavim našu dragu gošću. Ja mislim da većina vas već poznaje profesorku Majdu Thurner iz Beča. Ona će nam danas održati dva predavanja. Inače, samo još jedna informacija. Profesorka Majda je, da kažem, čuveni predavač svuda u svetu, naravno, i još nešto što je važno, pominjala sam, predsjednica Evropskog udruženja neuroradiologa, tako da će nam i sledeće godine biti dragi gost. Majda, izvoli, možeš da počneš sa svojim prvim predavanjem, koji će biti o infekcijama mozga. Hvala najljepša, Tanja, zahvaljujem se na pozivu. Naravno, opet mi je drago doći u Beograd i opet se moram izvinuti, odmah u svaki put počnem s izvinjenjem, što ću opet govoriti engleski. Isprobavala sam, isprobavala, ali nekako mi baš i ne ide. Znam, ja sam se kao malo djetovih svim gasarbajterima smijala koji su kao vraćali se kući pa nisu znali govoriti i sad se to baš događa meni. I sad to ja vjerujem i sad se više tome nikad neću smijati. Jako je teško ovako normalno razgovarati, to ide, ali održati medicinsko predavanje to je sad malo teže. Za sve diskusije može, samo ću ipak govoriti engleski ako mi dozvoljavate. Prvo predavanje će biti o infekcijama mozga, ja se nadam da ću završiti za 20 minuta, a drugo o promjenama bijele tvari, sve osim multiple skleroze. Tako da ćemo početi sa infekcijama mozga. What I will do with this lecture is, there is probably no enough time in 20 minutes to cover brain infections. We could go into bacterial, fungal, whatever. Or we can go into meningitis, brain abscess, and divide this into this. What I will do is something else. Maybe some of you have heard this lecture before. I will go with you starting with ring-like enhancing lesions. So everything which is ring-like enhancing and how to distinguish these. And then the last part will be so-called diagnostic algorithm of brain infections, means roadmap from imaging to pathogen. If you look at this slide, there are six lesions. All these lesions have kind of ring-like enhancing pattern. This one is a pyogenic abscess, fungal abscess, and aspergilloma, and all of them are relatively irregular and thick. The last row shows you a ring-enhancing lesions. They are relatively smooth and thin. They turned out to be neoplastic lesions. So it's pretty clear, based only on this slide, that you cannot rely on enhancement. Not even to distinguish bacterial from fungal or other infections, you can't not distinguish uh, abscesses of uh, um, infectious origin from neoplastic lesions. So what are we doing now in this lecture? We will go step by step. We will use so-called step-by-step -step approach. First, how to know if this is abscess or neoplasm. So distinguish immediately at the beginning. Am I dealing with neoplastic lesions? or infections. Then how to distinguish bacterial from fungal? When do you think on tuberculosis infection? When is it possibly toxoplasmosis? And finally, when is ring-like enhancing lesion a demyelinating lesion? You can use several techniques. The only thing that you can't do to distinguish abscess from necrotic neoplasm is to tell this based on conventional sequences. So that is definitely not enough. You can use diffusion, spectroscopy, perfusion, or SWI, or all together, all combination, one, two, or three, any of those. Let us look at the pyogenic brain abscess. This actually slide I owe to Robert Semnich, who gave me this many years ago, and I have never seen better abscess than this one. This would be perfect. If all of them would look like this, then life would be easy. This is a ring-like enhancing lesion. Ring is smooth. It's a little bit thicker on a cortical side, and it has a T2 low signal intensity capsule, which has several layers. It's very rare to see something nice like this, and has a perifocal edema, and it exactly corresponds to histopathology. But normal abscess, unfortunately, look like this. This is everyday routine. This is bacterial abscess, this is bacterial abscess, all of them, and they definitely do not look as smooth, as nice as the first one. So the first sequence that you should use is diffusion. It's the cheapest one, the shortest one, less than one minute. On diffusion-weighted image, pyogenic abscesses, not the others, pyogenic, will be homogeneously bright on DWI with very low ADC. So if you see something like this, relatively homogeneous and really bright, then you always think of bacterial abscess. 
So these are two lesions, almost the same location, almost the same appearance. Both lesions have ring-like enhancement, some a degree of edema, maybe this one some more, but there is no way to tell which one is what. This one is a pyogenic brain abscess, bright on diffusion, low ADC. The other one is metastatic disease, uh, low on diffusion with high ADC. What is the reason for restricted diffusion in a pyogenic brain abscess? The reason is very simple. It is a high viscosity fluid. Pus has a very high viscosity. In a high viscosity content, water molecules cannot move freely. So that is a very simple reason for that. There are two possible pitfalls, so nothing is 100%. First pitfalls are hemorrhagic metastasis. So looking at diffusion, they will sometimes, in certain stages, also give you bright signal. So you always have to look diffusion together with other sequences, especially blood-sensitive sequence. The other possibility to make a pitfall or to make a mistake is a high cellular metastasis, especially from small cell lung carcinoma, like this one, very bright on diffusion, very low ADC. Basically looking at um, T1 after gadolinium, it wouldn't really give you a ring enhancement, but it is possible. So two possibilities, hemorrhagic brain metastasis and very hypercellular brain metastasis will give you restricted diffusion. These are two patients, both proven bacterial abscesses. Again, this is bright on diffusion, low ADC. Now we can add perfusion. So what do we see on perfusion? Basically nothing. Let's make it simple. Perfusion is negative in brain abscesses. So there is nothing here, there is just a hole. Uh, the only thing that you might see sometimes, it's a very thin rim of increased RCBV in the capsule because the capsule possesses some kind of vessels. It has a very thin layer of neovascularity, so either nothing or very thin. Let me show you G uh, GBM, or glioblastoma. It has completely different picture on perfusion. Look at this, this is a lot of red parts. These are solid parts of the tumor with increased perfusion. This can never be an abscess. This is abscess in the posterior fossa that you sometimes might see in children, especially associated with some ear infection. Big abscess, a smaller one, or what we all co also call daughter abscess, bright on diffusion, negative perfusion. So that would be basically enough. But let's add another sequence. Let's add susceptibility weighted image. And why so? This would be a typical appearance of a pyogenic brain abscess on SWI. There are not so many articles about that, but the first one that appeared showing that is this one in AGNR 2012. They were actually comparing necrotic uh, neoplasms and pyogenic brain abscesses, and it turned out that SWI is actually very helpful. It's a very good sequence. If you don't do perfusion, but you do have three Tesla, that this would be your choice. If this ring is very smooth and it has two layers and it's complete, then you're looking at the bacterial abscess. If on SWI you do see dots and lines and this ring is not complete and not so nice, you're probably looking at a necrotic neoplasm. Let me show you some of my cases. This is just a simple T2. If, you would do, if we will do very good, uh, very high resolution T2, we might even also see these layers of the capsule. This is SWI and this is called dual rim sign, dark at the periphery, the outer layer, and the inner layer is actually bright. So this would be a perfect abscess if you would use all these sophisticated techniques. This is then flare, T1, negative on perfusion, bright on diffusion, low ADC, and complete dual rim sign. This would be necrotic GBM that looks very different. This is flare, this is T1 with gadolinium, dark on diffusion, high ADC. This part has a high perfusion corresponding to this part, which is the thickest enhancement. And on SWI, you don't see anything. Sometimes you do see vessels, but you never see a dual rim sign, either dots and lines or nothing. This is another one. This is a multifocal GBM. Now again, the same appearance, a lot of red. This is increased RCBV in a solid parts of the tumor. And then this is dots and lines corresponding to neovascularity in a GBM. 
We are not done yet. We could also use another sequence. This is a case that I like to show because it has a history that you remember. This guy was a psychotherapist who came one day when I was on call on a weekend and his wife brought him to the hospital telling us that he is actually very emotional and he's crying with his patients. And we were joking and saying, well, that's his job to cry with his patient and to show empathy. What's the problem? He was put on C into CT and we found one ring-like enhancing lesions. And we said, okay, this is a good one. Let's do MRI with everything on it. So this is a very thick enhancing on post contrast and this is perfusion. You see very thin rim, very bright, homogeneously nice, very dark and double rim sign. So this is again a perfect biogenic brain abscess in a patient who actually suffered from recurrent mastoiditis. So this was one of his episodes. And then as he was a good patient and we did not have many other patients that day, we added spectroscopy. So some people like to teach on spectroscopy. I think this is the most complicated way to distinguish neoplasm from pyogenic abscess. But let's look at that. So why do we even uh, use spectroscopy? We will have a breakdown of neutropils. Then we will have protolytic enzymes. And at the end, we will have amino acids, acetate, and succinate. So you need to make your spectroscopy working like that. So you need to, to look at these particular peaks if you want to distinguish this. So this would be also one of the sequences that you could use. And if we would like now to summarize, this is just a summary slide on pyogenic brain abscess, it would be low signal intensity capsule with several layers, peripheral enhancement with huge edema, which is not always smooth, so don't expect that. It's very bright, remember this, homogeneously bright on diffusion, low ADC, very low perfusion, and this smooth, complete rim called dual rim sign. So this is all that you expect in pyogenic brain abscesses. So the next question, now I know this is an abscess. Now my clinician will ask me sometimes, how do you know that this is really bacterial? This, could this be maybe a fungal abscess? So how do I answer this question, if a ring enhancing lesion is bacterial or fungal? There are several characteristics of fungal abscesses, so there is no one sequence to make this distinguishment. It's actually characteristics of fungal abscesses that should lead you into that diagnosis. And one characteristic is a dark T2 signal, so exactly the opposite as bacterial abscesses. Look at this one. This is aspergillus, this is aspergillus, two patients. But going back at T2, the lesion itself, it's very dark. It's very dark with bright edema. Exactly the opposite. So if sometimes my clinicians ask me or bring me some images from private practices, what I do not have sophisticated, then I always say, okay, it's enough if we go back to T2 sequence. If it's bright on T2, it will not be a fungal abscess. The other characteristic of fungal abscesses is their hemorrhagic nature. Why so? These are also two patients, both proven aspergillus infection. This is a very huge lesion, all dark, and these are multiple ring enhancing lesions with a lot of hemorrhage. Why so? Well, it is proven that fungal organism basically invades the vessels, so the infection starts very differently. If you remember pyogenic abscess from pathology, you have a softening of the brain tissue. You have first cerebritis, and then you have a real abscess. In fungal infections, it works very differently. Uh, the fungal organism invades the arteries and veins. You basically have angitis and thrombosis, so you have hemorrhagic infarcts. They convert into septic infarcts, and then you have a fungal abscess. That's why if you have ring-like enhancing lesions, they are dark on blood-sensitive sequences. Think fungal. The other characteristic of fungal abscesses is sometimes their size, especially candida abscesses will have very small sizes. These are called micro abscesses and you have to be very careful not to miss those. They are not even ring-like, they are actually nodularly enhancing. I think that's similar like um, candida abscesses in the liver or other organs. This is another one, this is a candida infection, this is a lesion. You see even on flare it's relatively dark on T2. This was a 34 years old after bone marrow transplant and she was uh, in a septic condition. This is another case when we learned the lesson and this unfortunate patient died because we did not make the right diagnosis. It was many years ago 
when we started working with HIV patient, he came with this and we thought like, okay, it sounds strange, it's not toxo, it's not lymphoma, it's nothing that we knew. A lot of small little lesions, but nothing was enhancing, so we were just not thinking about infection at that time. Patient came back two weeks later, it was even worse, so this is much bigger, but still not enhancing. This patient died from invasive aspergillosis. So another characteristic of fungal infections is sometimes non-enhancing lesions. So even if lesions are non-enhancing, but this patient fits into your category of se uh, severe immune compromise, think of a fungal infection, even if nothing is enhancing. So I told you you can't use sophisticated techniques because it's a, it's a very big overlap. Let me just show you a few cases so that you understand what I mean. This is a case that I got from United States of a huge lesion. You might think this is even a tumor, very bright on diffusion, low ADC, and it was a fungal abscess. And according to what I was teaching you, this should be bacterial. This is one of my patients, huge lesion that looks almost like a heart that has some septations inside, peripheral enhancement. It's dark on ADC and bright. Okay, this was aspergillus infection. Good. We did some study a few years ago on ADC between bacterial and fungal, and the overlap is too big. So you can't use diffusion to distinguish this. Diffusion can be dark uh, in the middle or the middle signal or very bright. So diffusion is not enough. There is something that I found in the literature. This is maybe helpful. Basically, you don't look at diffusion inside, like in bacterial abscess. You look at diffusion of the wall. This is much more important in fungal abscesses. And this is something called intracavitary projections. And this would be this. Basically, restricted diffusion in the wall of the fungal abscess. This is bright and dark. And they said this is the inner zone of the wall, and these are fungal organisms. Just picture fungal organisms sitting in the wall of this huge abscess. Let me show you this one. After I read this article, I usually read some articles and think, okay, sounds nice. Let's see if this is really true. Because you know how the first papers come out with five patients. We don't know if this will be true in the end. So this was a huge fungal abscess. You see, there is a thick wall, very thick, and the wall is actually having restricted diffusion, very dark, this. So this would be this intracavitary projections. We have also done a study with some of my colleagues from Croatia uh, to try to distinguish pyogenic from fungal using SWI, because we thought if SWI is good to distinguish tumor from abscess, maybe it's also good to distinguish bacterial from fungal. And actually, it was true. We did not have many patients, only 16 patients, and we used 3T and 1.5 because it was a retrospective study. And what we did find, all pyogenic abscesses really had this dual rim sign, but fungal abscesses never had the dual rim sign. So it becomes even more clear that this perfect dual rim sign is very specific for pyogenic abscesses. So this is a bacterial abscess, dual rim sign. This is a fungal abscess. It's dark, but it's very different. You see, this has two perfect layers, and this is just a black, a black rim. It looks, it looks very different. This you can only use if you're using three Tesla machines. So there is also some uh, kind of uh, cautious here. So on 1.5, this was bacterial abscess, and I don't see any dual rim sign. So dual rim sign, it's really characteristics for bacteria, for 3T, and for SWI, and not for other uh, machines. This is, again, the same abscess that you have seen before. I was just now adding SWI so that you're familiar and easy to follow. So look. It's dark, but it's not a perfect rim sign. So you see, this all, all combination of these findings will help you to make the right diagnosis. This is a 60-year-old male patient, double lung transplantation. Every time when I have a patient after bone marrow transplant or lung transplant or any solid organ transplant, then I'm very careful not to miss fungal infection because these patients will have fungal infections, not the normal immune competent patients walking around. So this was a lesion, you couldn't really describe this. It was not really a ring, maybe kind of ring-like, bright on diffusion, and then had these black dots inside, and we said, okay, this is a fungal infection. The patient is immune suppressed. Diffusion can be, you know, dark or less dark, but the hemorrhagic nature 
and the fact that he is a solid organ transplant patient leads to, to diagnosis of fungal infection. So this is again a summary slide showing that we have a central hypointensity on T2. Do not expect enhancement in severely immune compromised patients. Think of hemorrhagic nature, cortical location, little microabscesses in candida. The wall has a restricted diffusion and on SWI you don't see dual rim sign. You have thick black rim or some dots and lines. When it's um, um, abscess or tuberculous abscess, well, depending where you live, people would say, depending if you're living in an endemic area or not. And this answer is just partially correct. Of course, this is true that there are some endemic areas for tuberculosis, but as people are traveling, you cannot count on that, that you live in a country maybe with not so much tuberculosis infection. This was an Austrian child, not immune suppressed, nothing special, no special history, had a very severe tuberculosis infection which was predominantly located in the posterior fossa. Very dark on flare, very dark on T2, ring enhancing lesions in the both hemispheres and uh, iso intense on diffusion. This is also a very old, beautiful case that Robert Semnich uh, once gave me on tuberculosis infection. This patient has everything as a perfect case what tuberculosis should have. It has a meningitis with a very thick meningeal enhancement. It has hydrocephalus due to obstruction. It has infarcts bilaterally in the basal ganglia. It has multiple small little rings, tuberculomas, and finally, it even has a perineural spread into internal auditory canal. So this would be everything in one patient. But it doesn't always look like this, and you have to be careful not to miss tuberculosis in an early stage, because when it's in a uh, chronic or later stage, it will be very difficult to give a proper therapy. This is a case, again, that was missed, and I really like to show these cases, not because I'm trying to make my colleagues down, because these are cases that you learn. This was a young, actually Chinese origin individual, a female, 30 years old. She was brought because of headache in one of the smaller Viennese hospitals, and only two lesions were found, nodular lesion here and here. Nobody was actually listening carefully that she said she was having some fever attacks that would come and go, which is something that's not good. It doesn't fit to so many diseases, but it does fit to tuberculosis. So the diagnosis was nothing, basically, at that stage. Not even three weeks later, she was looking like this, and then she was transferred to university hospital. Now, she has a bright, glowing lesions in the basal ganglia, and for sure, some leptomeningeal enhancement. So if I see patient who has bilateral infarcts in the basal ganglia, then one of my first thoughts is this patient might have a tuber tuberculosis infection. And why is that so? You have a tuberculous exudate in the basal cistern, and this exudate will go to the little vessels in the basal region of the brain, and then you will have infarcts in the basal ganglia region. So bilateral basal ganglia infarct, think TB, and give contrast and see if you can see something. This is then another two or three weeks later. Now, of course, this really doesn't look so well. These are these infarcts again, hydrocephalus, and leptomeningeal enhancement that nobody will miss. So the point in this case is we should have thought about tuberculosis infection in the very first scan when we only saw two nodular enhancing lesion. So tuberculomas, the classic ones, are the caseating one that we think this is tuberculomas. These are ring-like enhancing with a low T2 signal, almost looking like fungal. But don't forget, we have non-caseating. These are the important ones. These have nodular enhancement and a T2 high signal. So in this particular infection, spectroscopy is helpful. If you would do spectroscopy, you would see a high lipid peak and lactate peak and no amino acids. So this is what people do in these endemic areas that tell me, especially in India even, they do a lot of spectroscopy because everything looks the same. And for them, this is a major differential diagnosis. So you're looking in spectroscopy for a high lipid peak. Toxolymphoma, that's still a question. We still cannot answer this question properly. So we still have HIV patients, and people think, well, 
uh, do you still see toxoplasmosis? Yes, I do, because remember, patients who are treated on anti, uh, retroviral therapy, these patients will not get toxo. But we have so-called naive patients or so-called late presenters. Late presenter is an HIV-positive patient who doesn't know that he's HIV-positive, so he lives normally, and at certain points he will come with toxoplasmosis. So this is still something to think of. You can't use diffusion. Early papers have shown diffusion is good. It's not. Many papers after that have proven, uh, again, you cannot use diffusion to distinguish toxo from lymphoma. What you should do, basically, go back to the old sequences. And one of these old findings is so-called eccentric target sign. When you look at this, it looks like a target. And this thing inside is thrombosed vein. And this is proven from pathological studies. You see this one? This is this thrombosed vein. So if you, it's seen only in 30% of the cases. But if you happen to see this, then this is very helpful. Let me show you one of my cases, a lot of lesions. Look at this one with this eccentric target sign. So at least one of the lesions will maybe have this. And this will help you to tell, OK, this really looks like toxoplasmosis and not like lymphoma. Of course, you can use all these sophisticated techniques. This was um, a young patient from an uh, Eastern European country. She was a doctor herself. She came to Austria. We looked at this imaging many times. And you know, when you think somebody's a doctor, then they don't have AIDS, then they don't have carcinoma, then you don't want to, to say this. So everything was said, uh, basically, metastasis and this and this and this. But it looks like toxo. What looks like toxo is toxo. Look at this target sign, like this one. And this is this huge lesion here. Everything was negative on perfusion, and we suggested Maybe she is a HIV positive and she is having toxoplasmosis, which was the case, and this poor patient also died. What you can also do if you have some time or good uh, technicians in MRI, you can overlay images. I keep telling this to my residents. Sometimes they say, I'm not sure in this uh, RCBV maps if I'm looking at the right place in small lesions. Well, then do overlay. You can overlay perfusion on T2 or you can overlay perfusion with T1. So then you're sure, OK, I'm looking at this big lesion here, and there is completely negative on perfusion. When is a ring-like enhancing lesion possibly demyelinating lesion? So you don't want to diagnose an abscess in a patient who is having multiple sclerosis. Think of several things. A ring can be closed in multiple sclerosis. This is closed ring, and this ring might have restricted diffusion. You see this one? And, it's, and this is just a simple multiple sclerosis lesion. A ring lesion, not much edema, restricted diffusion in the, uh, in the rim part. Or the ring can be open. Then it's called open ring sign. This is also very characteristic for tumor effective multiple sclerosis. You see this? The ring goes around and it's open on the cortical side. And of course, multiple sclerosis lesions will have elevated diffusion. If you're still uncertain, you might add perfusion, like in this case. This is a ring like enhancing lesion, it's an open ring. This is high ADC and, of course, negative perfusion. Another little thing that can help you, a little hint, ring-like enhancing lesion, this is diffusion, this is T2, this is T1 with gadolinium. Look at this dark line, and hope you can see it in the back. There is a dark line running through this big lesion on T2. And this is medullary vein. So we know from other studies that multiple sclerosis is growing let's say, growing around the vein, uh, along the vein. So this is known from 7 Tesla. So this dark line is actually a venous structure. So when are you thinking on demyelinating lesion? If it's high signal on flare T2, they're oval or round in shape, usually not much edema, although the lesion is big, elevated diffusion, low perfusion, you're looking for dilated veins, and don't forget the open ring sign. So we're coming to my diagnostic algorithm to cheer you up a little bit at the end. You know, I have shown so many rings and taught so many things. So basically, I'm having four rings here that you have seen already during my lecture. The easiest would be if you would have perfusion, because if perfusion is negative, forget the tumor, right? Then I know I forget neoplastic lesions and concentrate on all the other infections. And then I have to figure out which infection. This one, remember, dark on ADC, homogeneously bright on diffusion, 
and dual rim sign, this is bacteria. If it's here hemorrhagic and it has a restricted wall, this is a fungal infection. This is lipid peak in a questionable cases of tuberculosis. And this is, of course, uh, dilated veins in multiple sclerosis. I admit this is a very simplified approach. This was just a summary slide, what you have heard during this lecture. So how does this work? How, what is my roadmap from image to pathogen? So how do I get closer, closer, basically, to the final diagnosis? You always look first at T2. If T2 is dark, you go fungal, tuberculosis, toxo. You forget bacteria. If it's bright, you have a different, di different differential diagnosis. So this is always your first thing to look at. Then you add any of these. You can have everything if you have a long protocol and any of these. Then you should know something clinical about the patient, any kind of information, because differential diagnosis will be very different. And at the end, you might look at the patient yourself, which is probably not what we do. So let me show you a so-called challenging case. Some cases you cannot put in any diagram as much as you wish for, but it just doesn't work. This is a challenging case. You look at this, and you can't even really describe this irregular enhancement. This would be a case that you go, okay, somebody else should read this one, right? Or this is Friday case, and you say, I'll do this on Monday. That's not a good day. Well, so how, what should I do in something like this? Do I say tumor, or what should I do? Let's see if I can make it. You look at T2 and then you go like, okay, inhomogeneous, so not helpful. Diffusion, iso-intense, okay, at least it's not bacteria, that I can take out. Then you do perfusion negative, okay, I can take out tumor, so it's definitely not a glioblastoma because it will be positive on diffusion. So it's not bacteria, it's not glioblastoma. Then spectroscopy was not done and I don't have SWI. Okay, what do I know about the patient? The patient lives in South America, and he's having swallowing disorders. So something, if I correctly remember, somebody gave me this ahalazi or something like this. I'm really not good in, in general radiology. So let's say he's having this thing here, and he's from South America. And then we know that he was bite, he's a, a bug bite on his eye. So only because of this information, I can make a diagnosis of Chaga disease. So sometimes all this will not help you if you don't know anything about the patient. Okay? There is a challenge in case number two, and this was my case, and I was so sure about the diagnosis, and I was wrong. 14-year-old girl, they called me and said, okay, she's having headache, hemiparesis on the right, okay, that fits. She has seizures, okay, it's cortical, and no other history. And then I start uh, analyzing together with my residents, and I said, listen, this is perfect case of fungal disease. This is ring, this is here, this is on diffusion irregular, negative perfusion, hemorrhagic. She's a child, she must have that. Okay, so dark, relatively dark on T2. Diffusion is elevated, perfusion is negative, it's not a tumor, it's hemorrhagic. I said today many times, hemorrhagic ring enhancing lesion is a fungal abscess. Okay, so then I called them and I said, no, no other history, I said, listen, this child has a fungal disease, so this child must be immune suppressed. And they said, but Dr. Turner, she is not immune suppressed. I said, maybe you don't know, check it again. And I kept saying, this is a fungal abscess because it fits so perfectly to my lectures. It was not, you know, this was a bacterial abscess. And then you start thinking, why am I teaching actually this if things turn out wrong? And then I start looking at the literature, I said, I must have missed something, I should have known something. And basically there are some patients who are having heart disease, cyanotic heart uh, congenital anomaly. So patients with heart disease can get hemorrhagic bacterial abscesses. So okay, I learned the lesson and I'm sure that you will remember that. Challenging case number three is this one. I did not teach on this infection, but I would like to show you this one. This patient has a little lesion here you know, you can't do really much with this one. And then, like, three weeks later, it's bigger, and like six weeks later, he looks like this. So what did we miss? What did we miss here and why? So this is, again, this case. This is here, huge, dark on T1, not enhancing, had some little bubbles, negative on perfusion and this. I always look at perfusion first, then I say, okay, it's not a tumor, I should not worry. It's not bacteria and has this white rim on diffusion. Again, T2 bright, 
diffusion, perfusion, spectroscopy, all this, I'm sorry, I think this is not, okay, it has a white rim, so elevated diffusion in the middle and the white rim, very characteristic for one disease. Negative on perfusion, that we have seen, spectroscopy, you know, elevated choline, looks like a tumor, but it's definitely not, so no spectroscopy, no vessels, no neovascularity, no hemorrhage. This is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. What did we miss? What we missed was the fact that this was lymphoma patient and he was on immunomodulators. So you expect PML in patients who are HIV, and he was not. You expect PML in MS patients who are on Tisabri, he was not. He was having actually lymphoma and was put on immunomodulators. So now we put PML, if it fits, to almost all patients who are having immunomodulatory therapy. Okay, I think I'm getting a little tired. Okay, so. Uh, this roadmap will look like this, and this is, I think, the most important part to get to the real end. It's not the imaging, it's the information about the patient. You need to know all these things. You need to call them and ask them again and again to make the diagnosis. So conventional sequences will quickly show you this is ring or this is nodular or this is, but you really need a sophisticated technique to make a differentiation and some clinical information. And I thank you for listening the first part, and uh, if you want to ask some questions, you are free to do so. Thank you very much.